Hi everyone, my name is André and it's a pleasure to be here today talking to you about our work on confidential workloads with Spire. So I'll give you a brief introduction of confidential computing. And basically it's about protecting the data and the code of the applications and services. Because we are applying encryption to data at rest and data in transit for a long time, but the data in the memory is still in clear text, and that can become a vector of attack. So the idea of computational computing is that it can use hardware technologies to isolate these memory regions from other processes, even higher privileged processes like the operating system and the hypervisor. So these environments are called trust execution environments, and they are especially good for personal data, financial data, health data that can be very sensitive. And even some cases where you have different stakeholders which have different data pieces and they want to combine these data pieces and train some model, but not share the data directly with each other. And so SGX can and other trust execution environments can help you protect the ownership of this data in these cases. Uh, one other thing that is being used for is to shift trust away from humans because you can have secrets that are created inside enclaves and that are passed from enclave to enclave without never being in clear text uh, in the memory and without never have to be seen by a human. And that can help you to protect the integrity and confidentiality of these secrets. And when I'm talking about trust execution environment, I'm mostly talking about Intel SGX, which is the one that we have been uh, working with because it's the most common. So it's available in several cloud providers in, in server uh, off the shelf servers. And uh, Intel SGX more specifically, it, it helps because it has a reduced trust computing base. So typically you have a trust computing base that includes not only your workload, but includes the whole stack. So the operating system, the hypervisor, and the hardware. And now when you start using Intel SGX, what you get is that you take the operating system out of the trust computing base and also the hypervisor, and it stays with a much reduced uh, TCB. And in addition to this reduced TCB, you also get something that is called the remote attestation. And the remote attestation is based on the fact that one running application, so one application that's running inside an enclave, will have a signature, which is a 256 hash of the state that was constructed when it was loading. And this state includes code, data heap, stack, platform states such as if uh, hyper-threading was enabled or not, uh, what is the firmware version that the processor was using, if it was on debug mode or not. And this is very helpful for you to recognize when the correct code is executing on the correct platform. Remote attestation is especially useful for our uh, investigation here. And it's based on the fact that uh, challengers, so remote applications, can query one application to prove that is executing inside an SGX and what is the MR enclave that is associated with it. So these applications that are being tested have to negotiate with a local enclave that's part of the infrastructure. And this local enclave will help the application to construct a quote that is signed by a key that is private to that processor and this quote will be presented back to the challenger. And then the challenger can validate this quote with the attestation service. And once the quote is valid, the challenger can look into this report, this quote, and check if the MR enclave and the platform characteristics are what it expected. So today the, the attestation service can be uh, using the new uh, DCAP driver can be some infrastructure that is on-premise or on the cloud provider so that you can validate the code as, as I just mentioned. And what are, were the drivers for integrating computational computing in Spire? 
The first one is to secure this spark component itself, right? Because once you have this uh, SGX in place, what you can get is that you can protect the server by protecting its integrity. So if some code in the server gets changed by a malicious attacker, uh, the server would lose access to the database, would lose access to the CA certs, and that would prevent this attacker that uh, got control of the server code to do something malicious. The other thing is that you can also protect the confidentiality of the secret. So even if the code is intact, someone could look into the memory and steal identities, certificates, private keys. By executing these things within the enclaves, you don't have this uh, anymore. On the agent side, what you get is that you can, again, protect the integrity of the, the Spire agent code, and you can also protect the cached entries on the agent. So if someone gets access to the machine and controls the machine and the Spire agent is running on that machine, the Spire agent would have cached several SVIDs, and the SVIDs could be stolen from the memory, and SGX enable you to to block this access so that you, uh, the attacker cannot steal the secrets from memory. So, and then the confidential workloads, um, they also gain a lot when they are combined with Spire. First, you have a more robust uh, workload attestation for Spire. So uh, we have already the, the ones related to Linux, the ones related to Docker, um, Kubernetes, uh, and others. But now you get one that is based on the hardware support and that can check if the correct code is being loaded in an up-to-date uh, processor. And from the confidential computing side, you also gain a lot when you get the support from Spire because now you can have one single way to handle identities, which, which are the, the uh, spiffy verifiable IDs, but you uh, abstract what was the actual attestation to that identity. For example, you could have one identity that reflects a highly trusted workload, and this highly trusted status could be gained because the workload is executing inside an enclave, even if in a less trusted environment, or if the workload is executing without the SGX support, but in a trusted environment. Right, so a, a, a on-premise, for example, that you a place that you, you trust. And this flexibility simplifies the operation between uh, SGX and non-SGX workloads, which is a, a nice plus because SGX by itself could have a high, highly steep learning curve. As we advanced with our development, we faced several challenges, and I would like to um, tell you about a few of them. And the first one is related to the threat model. So when we change the threat model of an existing system, we have to make sure that we have safe defaults and that we make clear the trade-offs. And, and this can be confusing to the user because if the user configures an uh, agent that's not running inside SGX to attest the workload that is running inside SGX, what does he have now. So it not, does not make a lot of sense because an uh, uh, attacker that gains access to the machine could steal the identities of the confidential workload and pose as it. The same way as if you protect a server with SGX, but the database is not protected by SGX. So what you have, things would work, but an attacker could change the entries in the database, forcing the server to sign uh, identities for malicious workloads. So this is this is tricky, and you have to make this uh, easy, but still visible and transparent to the users so that they can understand what they get and what they need to pay attention to. On the workload attestation side, there are a few challenges. One is that um, the regular workload attestation plugins, they rely on things that come from untrusted uh, sources of information in this new threat model, because now the, the Kubernetes, the kernel, 
the Docker engine, they are not trusted anymore. So you cannot use the sources of information. And even the process ID that you use to start getting information about the workloads can be changed. So you could get one process ID, try to talk to this process ID for doing the detestation, but then an attacker reroutes your query to the original workload. So you end up giving the SVID to the wrong process, and that's something you don't want. The attestation, as I, as I mentioned when I was talking about SGX and the remote attestation model, is also something that needs to be well considered because in the Spire model, it is done with an out-of-band communication. And as I said, this out-of-band could be deviated. But it's also the case that you don't want this out-of-band communication to give an extra work to the developer. Because if the application needs to be modified to run with confidential computing and Spire at the same time, you pose yet another obstacle to, to the adoption. And finally, the code integrity, which is given by the MR enclave, as I just said, uh, it's not enough because we know that configurations and, and libraries and other things that could be on the, on the file system could make a difference on how the application runs. Operation is the final challenge. So there are a few things that we need to consider here. The first one that I mentioned is that uh, VM migrations are not allowed with SGX natively. So if you have one SGX component running a machine, a virtual machine, and this gets migrated to another server, maybe you don't run it. It will not run anymore. Uh, other thing related to the configuring uh, configurations that were passed by the orchestrator typically. Now, how do you provide these configurations in a secure fashion? Third, uh, if you have Operators, sysadmins running your Spire environment, shouldn't they be out of the circle of trust so that you, you can be sure that they're not capable of assigning private or highly privileged identities to non-sufficiently attested workloads? And finally, you have to think about everything. So you need to consider not only the Spire server and the Spire agent, but other things that will contribute to this ecosystem, such as the the, the orchestrator, which should be kept non-trusted, the database that should be trusted, either you run it with SGX or you put in a place where you trust, but you have to understand all these uh, points before you have your operating environment. So now I will pass to Mateus, who is going to talk a bit about the current state of our uh, development. Hi, everyone. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about our current status. And the status is that now we are supporting SCON SGX workloads. And you may be asking, uh, why SCON? First, using lift and shift approaches like uh, SCON enable us to easily migrate existing applications. Think about that. Sometimes it is as easy as changing the base images of your docker files. Second, uh, leveraging the SCON configuration and attestation serves the CAS circumvents some operation challenges for us, uh, mainly related to sealing and configuration. And also we can save some effort with the development process. In the SCON world, uh, SCON workloads are defined by sessions and think, of, think uh, of sessions like security policies. And sessions contain policies stating conditions for the attestation process and also some initial configuration for the workloads. Uh, this configuration could include uh, environment variables, command line arguments, and also configuration files injected in the file system view of the workload. So, uh, if a workload can be defined by its session, we can use the session name and the session hash uh, as selectors in Spire. And to make this integration work, we are using a svidstore scon plugin. Uh, 
And our plugin pushes identities into the cast, the attestation self sucks con, delegating the attestation process to this trusted component. And the process is as follows. Uh, the, the workflow is as follows. Uh, first, uh, we have to push this initial configuration into CAS to then receive the, the hash of the session. And then, with the session name and the session hash in hands, we can register our workload. When the agent gets this entry, it will push the identity into the CAS so that after the deployment process and after the attestation process uh, the CAS will deliver the identity to the workload so that the workload can talk to other services and then receive uh, sensitive data. And now uh, I'm going to show you a quick demo about the user's experience of our solution. So, uh, for this quick demonstration, uh, I have here a SPIF enabled Kafka and two applications that will interact with this Kafka. A producer, that is a regular application that gets SVs via workload API, and a consumer, that is a confidential workload getting SVs via our is store SV plugin. So first, I'm going to register an entry for the producer using the container name and the namespace as selectors. And then I can deploy the producer. Maybe we can see WIDs and putting them in a token to Kafka. So now uh, I have to post the session for my confidential workload and I have a session here that defines the constraints for attestation and the initial parameters for this application. I will put, post this session using the SCON CLI. And I will get the session hash of the session. Remember, I will be using the session hash and the session name to register my confidential workload to give um, the identity slash consumer to that workload. Okay? And my plugin already started to push the identities and the CA and everything else it needs uh, into the configuration and attestation service. So that now I can deploy my consumer. It will get attested and then receive this feed. That's it. It started to consume messages from the same topic. And to conclude this presentation, uh, we have some ongoing and next steps. Uh, one thing we are working currently is how are good ways to manage these beef namespaces and take the and take the operator out of the circle of trust. Uh, we also are collaborating with some folks at TU Dresden which are investigating ways to enable uh, confidential workloads to use the workload API. So code that is aware of SPIF should not need to be changed uh, to use the confidential computing attestation plugins. And, and then finally, uh, we can consider some more components of the Spark ecosystem, uh, just like uh, upstream authority plugins, uh, the usage of federation, Spire database and so on. Uh, luckily, 
Uh, there are some confidential computer alternatives for the database like MariaDB on top of Scone and also the Edgeless DB. Yeah, so I think that's all. Thank you everyone for the attention.